All right, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first uh, seminar of 2018. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Diana Varela, from the uh, University of Victoria. Uh, I met Diana back in, uh, what is that, 1996 in Goodhoe. She was working uh, on her master's degree. I was doing my postdoc. And no, then, not, not 96. It was way earlier, right? No, 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 not 1996. <laughs> I, was not, doing not P, I was doing my PhD in 96. <laughs> Oh really? What? Never mind. Okay, whatever. We don't start the time. Never mind. I was, you know, back in the time. <laughs> then she moved on to a PhD to the uh, University of British Columbia. Uh, I was a PhD in biological oceanography, and then she did a couple of postdocs, and then she joined the uh, University of Victoria as a faculty. And uh, she just told me that she's going to be a full professor very soon. So congratulations. Yeah, hopefully, right? it's in a few yeah. couple months. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right, so uh, Diana's uh, research is on um, ecophysiology of phytoplankton and marine biochemistry, and uh, working on uh, diverse topics, you know, very basic and applied. For example, a couple of applied topics that caught my eye is uh, the use and applications of bioreactors for aquaculture, and uh, also um, uh, production uh, of uh, value products for cyanobacteria. So that's, that's kind of you know, a very nice applied angle for uh, phytoplankton uh, ecophysiological studies. Uh, but today we'll be talking about something else, right? Mm -hmm. About the Arctic and right. uh, silicon <laughs> and biochemistry and phytoplankton. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. And thank you for uh, bringing me here. It's, I'm really excited. I've never been deep south of, uh, of the States. <laughs> I live in different parts of the States, but never been here. So thank you very much. This is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, so I'm going to take you very far away from here. I'm going to take you to the Arctic. And a lot of the work we've been doing in the last number of years has been in polar regions. I also have projects in Antarctica. But this work that you see today here is Arctic. Uh, so, um, um, so I'm going to be talking about primary production production changes in the Arctic and um, also some work that we've done on silicon uptake and other uh, and isotopes. Um, and we're going to look at, you know, how this varies, the, the, the results that we obtain from variations of productivity in the Arctic and some highs and lows in different parts and what the roles of diatoms are in those regions. Uh, this is where I'm coming from. It was a long, a long, uh, I'm from Argentina originally, so this is not as far, but it's also like halfway almost. Oops, am I losing my microphone? Okay. Um, so, um, can you still hear me okay there? Uh, this is our campus, just so that we're also surrounded by water. But I'm, I'm at the University of uh, Victoria. University of Victoria is uh, right here. It's in the, very close to Seattle, which is around there. Um, and it's the capital of British Columbia, so that's where this university is. And I have to always clarify, because there is a Victoria University in New Zealand, I think. So uh, this is University of Victoria. Um, okay, so um, what I'm going to be covering in this talk, I told you a little bit already, I'm going to first give you an overview of projects we've been doing that we started doing about 10 years ago, uh, looking at productivity in the Arctic, just basically different indices of production, carbon uptake, nitrogen uptake, and so on, and, and standing stocks. Um, and then I'm going to, you'll see from that distribution, with general distribution, that are areas of high productivity, and I'm going to focus a bit more on those areas and look at the role of diatoms in those particular regions. Um, and then I'm going to give you, hopefully, enough time, uh, going from other type of, uh, just to brush over a few other projects that we work on, going from different scales, from a cellular scale all the way to ocean basin scales, from using um, you know, certain techniques, like some that Jeff knows very well, which is a PDMPO a tracer that we're using too, to look at how things, uh, how silicon is taken up into cells. And then we're also looking at silicon isotope signatures, uh, more of a basin, basin large scale. So I'm going to go from the small to the large scale. And then um, move on just very briefly, uh, telling you, okay, how do we move beyond this? You know, we go to the Arctic. It's very difficult to do work in the Arctic and polar regions in general. Accessibility is an issue. So we have these snap snapshots of data all over. Uh, so how do we move from that? To if we, uh, and, and we could potentially predict, at least try to figure out how changes may be happening in the Arctic over time. 
So, of course, if you're not a phytoplankton uh, obsessed kind of person like me, you need to probably be reminded that phytoplankton are very important in, in, the, in, in, in uh, marine ecosystems. Uh, of course, they carry out photosynthesis, take up CO2, we solar energy and nutrients, and of course, in the process, they release other, ox other, other gases like ox oxygen and DMS. Uh, and of course, they, they have a, then a critical importance in terms of uh, atmospheric and aquatic chemistry. And they're also obviously the base of the food web with uh, obvious in implications and the different size structure that you see on some phytoplankton will have implications on how the energy is transferred through the food chain. And they also, when they die, they carry with them uh, some of their, their hard parts like silica and calcium carbonate that they contribute to the formation of sediments in the ocean floor and the accumulation of carbon. So this is sort of in a nutshell uh, why we care about them. And, and particularly, we care about diatoms quite a bit, at least Jeff and I are very interested in diatoms, and I don't know if everybody else is, but we are. And uh, one of the reasons is because they do drive the biological pump, or that pumping of carbon from, from the surface to deeper waters. If we look at productivity here in the, this is earth production, right, of carbon, uh, diatoms represent about 20% of all that photosynthetic fixed carbon, and about 40% of the, of the uh, ocean derived photosynthetic carbon. And they also link cycles, they have these fractures or these cell walls made of silica, so they are important for biogeochemistry because they link the, 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 the nutrients of sort of silicon, carbon, and nitrogen. So why are we interested in the Arctic? Well, the Arctic is, we are studying a moving target, right? Things are changing, we're trying to get baselines, but we can't really get those baselines because things are already changing. And if we look at the changes in, in even this uh, ice area in the Arctic, you can see here, this is the, um, basically the, the ice coverage that you find at the very end of the summer, and this was in the early 80s. If we look at what it is, what it was in 2012, for example, which is one of the minimum, and then go into the present, this is now what the coverage could be in the summer. And we predict that in, it's predicted that in very short time, maybe a couple of years, it will be a, an ice-free uh, ocean in the summer. So things are changing dramatically. And what it means for phytoplankton is that, and this is a cartoon that I borrowed from uh, a nice paper from Wasman, 2011, where he's showing, and I'm going to only tell you a couple of things of this, you know, what happens with, you know, why the lack of ice is important, or actually could have consequences. And, oops, I'm sorry. And. Um, you could see here, for example, this would be an old case scenario where only a very small part of the year is exposed to light because the ice has retreated. Uh, but with uh, ice retreating more and more over time, it's just exposing a larger area. So the prediction that some people are making is that while you have a larger area exposed to photosynthesis, now more light, the production will increase. The issue is that we know that the Arctic is nitrate limited, and uh, many, many large areas of the Arctic are. So more light doesn't necessarily mean more production. You need a nutrient input from somewhere. Uh, but it also has other, this, this uh, increase in, this decrease in the ice coverage has other consequences, not only that the growing season increases, now production is spread out through a longer time. The ice is thinning also, so a lot of we, we, people have observed that because with thinner ice, more light go, goes through it, and you could have blooms happening, phytoplankton blooms happening under the ice that supposedly didn't happen in the past. So things are, are changing. And we also know that in, in, the, in the Arctic, um, in many regions, there is evidence that in some regions, um, large cell-dominated communities like formed by diatoms are, are changing to a small cell-dominated communities. And those smaller cell communities have effects, obviously, on the transfer of energy through the food web and on the uh, export of carbon. So all these changes are important for us to understand, to see how the Arctic is going to behave in terms of a carbon exporter or, 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 or in terms of the ecosystem dynamics. So um, I'm going to start giving you an overview of, uh, so st uh, this is a very general overview of uh, Arctic productivity study that we started. There's a number of people, these are all from my lab, that had worked and we work on dif two different ships for this project that, is, uh, that span over two years. Um, and basically, and this goes back 10 years now, a little bit more, 10 and a half years. Uh, tons of data were produced from this project. This was part of the International Polar Year. So I'm going to start here, I'm going to bring you to the present. Um, and on, in, 2007, in 2007, we started from here from the uh, east coast of Canada, and we moved through the um, Labrador Sea, Buffy 
Baffin Bay, <clears throat> and the Canadian Arctic Archipelago right here, and then into the Beaufort Sea and the open waters that are very, very um, nutrient limited. And the year after, we started on the other side. Ideally, this should have done all at the same time, but the logistics were impossible to do this at the same time. So we had a very nice coverage from side to side all around the, 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 the North American continent of productivity. So these are other projects that we've been involved in that also increase the data coverage. And this is a time series that we're continuing over time with people from the University of Maryland. And this is the DBO project that basically concentrates studies in this region of the Bering, North Bering and Chachki Seas right, right there. <coughs> And this is a time series that at this point we have about 10 years of data, and this DBO uh, um, stands for Distributed Biological Observatory. So how do we do these experiments? Well, at each one of those, if I take you back here, all these little dots here are our stations. We had about f almost 50 stations around uh, the Arctic. And at each one of those depths, uh, uh, those stations, we did six depth measurements of a number of things. And uh, they're just listed here uh, from basically physical, physical characteristics and nutrients and standing stock of chlorophyll A as an index of phytoplankton biomass, biogenic silica as an index of uh, diatom biomass, and, and phytoplankton species. And then we did all these uh, incubation experiments looking at productivity. So we studied, um, for example, car we use carbon-13 to look at the carbon incorporation of the primary productivity rates. Uh, we use and nitrate uptake, ammonium, urea, different indices basically of, of phytoplankton production. And we also used uh, silicon-32 in some of these experiments. This wasn't done during the whole coverage, but was mainly done in the, in the western side, in the bearing. And uh, of course, we incubate these things on, on the ship, on incubators that simulate the light levels through the water columns. So we have the vertical here represented in the horizontal. Uh, and we do these incubations and we measure these uh, cor correspondingly. So bring you back to this slide, um, what I'm going to show you is data uh, and that it's covering each one of these dots and each, remember that each one of those locations we have six steps so the data is integrated through the water column and we get this one value. I, and, and then what we did after, afterwards, after seeing the distribution of things through, the, through this region, what we did is uh, we chose different regions. These are five domains that were uh, not randomly selected but they're selected based on the physical oceanography of the regions as, as being distinct one from the other. So this is a heavy slide. It comes out of the, our paper, um, but I want you to come. They're all showing the same kind of thing. So you have the, the uh, um, oops, I'm sorry. I went way too fast. I pushed the wrong thing. I meant to push this one. So here, for example, uh, let's concentrate on, this is raw sea, meaning the, the permanent production rates, the amount of carbon taken up. Uh, this is the chlorophyll A, the biomass. This is new production, the incorporation of nitrate. And but you all see similar trends, where you have, uh, if we just look at the Arctic region, not at the subarctic right here, just to make it a bit more clear. So we have high, high incorporation rates in the Bering Chachki. No surprise, it is a really an area of high production. Action, the issues are how high it is. And then we have very, very low productivity in the Canada Basin or that buffer, offshore buffer uh, sea, which is very oligotrophic. And then we have these hotspots of production on the eastern side through the archipelago into Baffin Bay. And the same you can see for chlorophyll A, high, low, highs and highs. For new production, same thing, or incorporation of nitrate, uh, we have highs and low and highs. So they, they all show similar trends. Uh, in terms of all these indices of productivity. Um, the same for looking at standing stocks. If you want to look at, uh, for example, biogenic silica, we have values here pretty high in the, again, the Bering Chachki region, well known, very shallow, about 40 meters deep or so in some places, very, very shallow, very productive. The um, reason why oil companies are interested in all that, you know, that region is lots of productivity sinking out to the bottom. Um, and then, for example, particular uh, carbon here, particular nitrogen, the amount of particular carbon and nitrogen, and I blocked it out. I'm sorry. There. 
there's one, two, three, four, five buttons here, and I can't see. So, okay. So um, here you see the same idea, basic distribution of particles, biogenic silica, high, very low, a few high spots right there, carbon and nitrogen, same, they all show the same thing, meaning that there are areas of high production, areas of very low production, and they seem to be consistent for all the parameters we've been measuring. So the other thought that was interesting to show you is that um, this data that I just show you is basically um, um, sort of the gives a horizontal distribution is integrated at each one of those locations, but we do have spatial, especially vertic uh, vertical spatial resolution in depth. So you could see here, for example, this is a very long transit. It's 12,000 kilometers starting from uh, basically home here, my home, going all around to the eastern side. And of course, this doesn't give justice to all that data. This 12,000 kilometers is compressed into these little plots, but it gives you some idea of the changes and where the hotspots are. And again, you can see this is, uh, let's start from here, this is the, 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 this region right there, this would be the Chachki, the Bering Chachki, this is the, the Canada Basin, very low, this is a productivity, primary productivity, carbon uptake, very high, very low throughout the water column, and then those hotspots are also seen here. But what is interesting to see here that when you look at now the chlorophyll A, the chlorophyll A expands much, much broader into the water column, and, and you can see that it goes, you know, deeper in the water column. In the same places where it's high, but it extends deeper in the water column. So it's common in the Arctic to see subsurface chlorophyll maximum, and we could we see it in some of the data. Uh, now, the other interesting thing that I want to show you is that if now, instead of going all around, if I'm going to take, if I take a transect from the, sh from close to shore, uh, in the buffer uh, shelf into the Canada Basin that is really, really low productivity, you see right here, it's all blue, there's really not, not much going on. Uh, but you can see, for example, this is again, this is your carbon uptake, it's a little bit happening in the shore here, and then it just goes extremely, very, very oligotrophic, very low nutrient concentrations. And the other interesting feature is that you can see this uh, chlorophyll max that you observe in this region at about 40 meters. And that's the region where the pycnocline is and the nutricline, so there is enough light still for, the photo, for photosynthesis, some nutrients coming from underneath, and you have this chlorophyll maximum that you see. And it's a feature that you could see in different places of the Arctic. So if we know, okay, that data gives you some a snapshot of what's happening all around, but uh, how do we compare different regions? So the other approach we took was to basically separate these five domains, and this which you see up there, so this is the whole region, and these five domains, and as I said before, the division is based on basically the physical characteristics of the region. And, and you see all the parameters that we measured, and if we just concentrate, for example, on the productivity uptake of carbon, uh, the biomass of chlorophyll A, and new production, the amount of new biomass produced uh, calculated through nitrate uptake, you could you could see the same trend in all of them, where you have higher uh, productivity in this particular scenario in the Bering Chachki, very low in the Canada Basin, and, and, and with some hot spots in the in the um, uh, in the archipelago, which is all that very complex area full of islands or so, and in the, in Baffin Bay. And you see the same for everything. It's this deep down right and dipping down in the in the in the Canada Basin, the, oli the oligotrophic waters. So the question was. Um, what phytoplankton are responsible for these patterns? So we did just for these experiments, we also, for this study, we also looked at uh, phytoplankton composition and we just did basic microscopy. Um, and we noticed that if we, what we have here is just very big groups, nothing too specific at this point. Um, and we look at just basically a whole bunch of identified and out flagellates that are less than uh, eight microns in size, dinos, diatoms, cryptomonas, and others. Um, so, and you, what you see in these pie charts here is basically the percentage of each one to the total abundance. And in this one, you have the percentage of each one in terms of the amount of car cellular carbon they contribute to the, to the assemblage. So, if I show you uh, the different regions, you could see that the, in terms of numbers, in the um, numbers of uh, organisms, uh, in every scenario, you have that the small cells actually contribute considerably to the, 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 the abundance. But in terms of the carbon, how much they contribute to carbon, these are tiny cells, there are lots of them, but diatoms are big, and dinoflagellates are big. So in terms of the amount of carbon, these other groups like um, 
um, uh, diatoms right here are quite important in, in, um, in abundance. And you see clearly in the Bering Chachki and clearly in the archipelago and also in Baffin Bay. So one, mes one uh, message here is that we know now, right, that the numbers don't tell us the whole story and we tend to still count things, but it's also how much they contribute to the amount of carbon in the water. So these regions then are these three regions right here and these high regions, so that's the regions of sort of hot spots, what we considered are uh, dominated by diatoms in terms of their biomass. And this is what I showed you before. This is basically the biogenic silica. Again, this happens where they have this index of diatom uh, biomass is also high in those three regions. And also the chlorophyll in the larger fraction, which is norm, norm, uh, normally dominated by diatoms in this region is also high. So this is all conducive to, 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 to believe that these regions are really, well, they're hotspots and they're dominated by diatoms. So um, now I'm going to focus uh, for a little bit into these two areas, the east and the west, basically, and, and, and see what diatoms are doing there, those areas of, that's what we call these hotspots. Um, this is a, a part of a project of one of my, my PhD students, and, um, and this is also results that came out of the Canadian Arctic Geotraces program uh, that we've been involved and is still ongoing. And uh, so I'm going to compare data that we, now we have in, from 2015 at the same time in the two sides of the, of the Arctic, the west and the east. These different students went to different cruises, so we could compare this, uh, this data at the same time and they were almost the same days of the calendar days that were done. Um, so this is basically the cruise track. Uh, during the, we're going, this is all the geotraces cruise track, but I'm going to show you data, biological data, only f from this uh, transect in the red here. So it's, this is the stations that I'm going to show you some uh, um, carbon uptake data and also silicon uptake data. So if we look at the carbon uptake, this is now starting from up here. The CAA refers to the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, and it goes down into the Labrador Sea. Uh, well, carbon uptake is sort of up and down. There is not a, a particular trend that we could see. Um, but when we look at the silicon uptake in this region, it does have a clear trend. And it's where the silicon uptake is pretty high right on the archipelago, where you have these hot spots of activity by diatoms. And then it goes down. So a lot of the production that is coming actually from Baffin Bay, from this region, and that I showed you before, there are some hotspots of production, and actually not diatoms, and we know there are lots of dinoflagellates there. But uh, in terms of if we're just looking at the diatoms in particular, this area on the archipelago right here is quite uh, dominated by diatoms, and we look at the silicon to carbon uptake ratios, um, and they're sort of indicative of a healthy diatom assemblage. So this is quite interesting to see how this Basically, the, the diatom uh, activity goes down uh, with distance from the archipelago. So now if I move you to the other side, to the western side, now we're here in the Bering Chachki, and again, it's data from one year, uh, but we do have data now that spans about 10 years. Um, but I'm showing you this one year, so that it compares to the two ends of the, the, the Arctic. Uh, oops, sorry. And then you have the stations that we sampled were right here. So these are five locations that are uh, D DBO, Distributed Biological Observatory hotspots, and this is what everybody has been measuring different parameters uh, over over the over the over a decade, I think. So uh, although you see her picture twice, she wasn't at the same time in both cruises. It was my other student that went on the western side while she was on the east. So now we're looking at, this is a station right on the south, the Bering, and you're moving up. So the Bering, the Bering Strait, Chachki, and the Chachki also farther north and into Barrow Canyon up there. And you can see a very clear hotspot right in the center here, Chachki Shelf, well known for high productivity. Um, if we look at silica uptake, it shows a very similar pattern. So all that high productivity is due to the activity of these diatoms. And another interesting thing is that this amount of uh, production that happens right here in the Chachki Shelf is, is about seven times higher than the highest value that we obtained from the eastern side. 
And this uh, silicon uptake is about five times higher than the highest value on the eastern side. So this is definitely a hotspot of activity in the Arctic. So if I put all this data from the west and the east together, you already show you this, but now it's on the same scale. Uh, you can see although these are two big hotspots of activity, the west and the east, not the central Arctic, which is very oligotrophic, you still can see that the, um, you know, under the, when you put them on the same scale, that really the Bering and the Chikachi win on this competition. So they have very, very high rates. So then I'm going to show you, uh, I'm not going to get too deep into this because I know chefs know a lot more about this than me, so I'm not going to get too much into this. <laughs> But I'm going to show you some other experiments we're doing also on the Berinchatki, doing the same cruise in 2015. And it's using this uh, interesting uh, um, fluorescent probe, and I will not even dare to say the chemical name for that. Let's call it PDMPO. Uh, it's a fluorescent probe, and you, you say put it in an incubation like you do with silicon or carbon or other isotopes, but this, this fluorescent marker goes into the cell, and it could be uh, with some restrictions, but it could be uh, used as an indic indicator of silicon uh, deposition or incorporation into the cell. So if you put this into the cells and let them incubate for some time, like 24 hours, these are some pretty pictures that are generated where, wherever that, that signal has been taken on the flash show. Uh, so these are uh, pictures that uh, Jennifer took of the, some of her diatoms in culture and in the, in, in the field. Uh, after these cells had been marked or labeled with uh, PDMPO. So this is, for example, just some pictures. This is a bright, you know, under bright field microscopy and an assemblage composition of a uh, phytoplankton that you don't see very much. Uh, but then uh, when you give them the signal and you let them take that signal over time, you have a much clearer image. Um, this is a chain of diatoms, and this is what it looks like after um, they, they took the signal. So it's at least very pretty whether we could do a lot with this or not in terms of determining production is a different story, but it gives you nice pictures and you could quantify the amount of fluorescence that comes out of these cells and compare them to each other. Um, this is interesting to see how you can see that only half of each cell has been labeled and that's nice to see that what we learn about diatom uh, division is true and in every division cycle uh, diatoms have this uh, two frustules and they only produce one new one in each cycle and they inherit the other one from the parent uh, cell so you could see only half of it being formed in each cycle. And these are some other pictures that Jennifer took. At least they're very pretty pictures. So what I want to show you is just this one slide um, that shows um, these are um, different stations. They come again from down south to the north. Uh, the top bar, these are uh, integrated data. The top bar just is cell numbers, basically the percent of the particular genus to the total. And this is the amount of PDM fluorescence that we could uh, detect from those that particular genus uh, compared to the total of the whole assemblage. So you can see, for example, and the interesting thing that comes out of this is you can see a little bit more of just bulk silica production. You can see what the different genus are doing, or these in general are doing. Uh, for example, here, ketoceros, you know, if you look at cell number, ketoceros represents about 70% or so of the total cells in that assemblage, and in terms of the PDMPO, how much of that signal they are taken up, that could be, as I said before, a, a, an index of silica deposition. Uh, they actually have an, a, a role in, in silica dynamics, you know, similar as their numbers. Uh, however, others, like Thalassiosira, for example, they are present in small numbers, as you can see here. Um, but then, in terms of the amount of uh, the contribution they have to this deposition of silica through this tracer, it's a lot larger. So which means that even if you're in small numbers, that does not mean you have little impact. You can actually consider impact even if you're in small numbers. Uh, another one, for example, another example here, you have uh, this particular diatom uh, polyella, which is in, in you know, certain what is that, about 20% in terms of their contribution to the assemblage, but when we look at how much they contribute to silica deposition is very little. So which is, this is telling us a little bit, go sort of deeper into the cellular level and trying to understand what the contribution of these different diatoms are, and not just a bulk number. So it's, it's nice to see that not all diatoms are equal. Right? So what I'm going to do now is um, 
move, change gears a little bit. So I show you, you know, distribution of productivity through the Arctic, what we found during a couple of years, and then over the years after, you know, focusing on these hotspots of activity. Um, but I'm going to change gears a little bit, and this is another area of research of my lab, which is we look at natural isotopic signatures uh, of silicon. And we use them as a... Um, index of a couple of things. One is that they could be used, and geotraces were very interested actually in using it. I was part of Canadian geotraces uh, to use them as a, um, uh, can we identify water masses basically with uh, these signals? And we in work that we did previously uh, in 2009 that was published actually last well, now a year and a bit ago, we work in these, these white dots here. That was the first phase of geotraces, the Canadians, and we work there. This has been published in this paper. And we saw that, yes, the layering of water masses that you see in this part of the, of the Arctic is very clear water. There's very different water masses sandwiched. You have the surface, fresh water, basically um, um, melting water. You have a Pacific layer water. You have an Atlantic waters, and you have the bottom Canadian waters. And they're really clearly seen in the signatures of the silicon uh, isotopes. So, so we could say, yes, then you could use the silicon isotopes to um, help, together with other traces, determine water mass distribution. But from a biological perspective, we're also interested to try to, where, whether, to see whether these uh, variations in these isotopes are telling us anything about a silicon utilization uh, in, in sort of seasonal scale, for example. Uh, so what we did is we uh, compare silicon isotope measurements with silicon 32 uptake measurements, 24-hour measurements. Uh, so when you do this type of measurements, like silicon uptake or even PDMPO, whatever you use as a, as a, as a tracer uh, that you spike into your sample, you do have a, you know, a time scale of a day in which things are happening. Uh, when we look at these silicon isotopic signatures, um, then the time scales are more like seasonal or annual. So it gives us a different type of information. And the way this happens is that when, when, when diatoms in the water will take silicon into their cells, they, they um, basically prefer the lighter isotopes. So there's three stable isotopes of silicon, 28, 29, SI 28, 29, and 30, and they will prefer the, low, the, the, the ones with the, um, the lighter ones, which means that waters that have a lot of production normally become heavy, uh, then the water, the signals in the water become heavy, and waters that have little production of diatoms, the waters are normally lighter. Uh, so this, this, so by looking at these signals, can we really say anything about silicon utilization by diatoms? And because they give us different time scales, they're really interesting to understand. This figure, I'm not going to explain in a lot of detail. It just came out of the oven, this data. It was given to me right before I flew here. Uh, I was my PhD student. And uh, basically, we have the silicon isotope data um, now going all around here. So this part here on the eastern side was part of the Canadian Geotraces, 2050. In 2015, and all this region here is the Distributed Biological Observatory, also 2015. I would like, there's a number of features in this, these figures that I do not want to get into. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk to you later. But for the purpose of this talk, trying to understand or trying to figure out if there is a link between the signals and silica uh, incorporation, I, want, I would like you to look at, um, this is the, the western side. This is the Bering Chachki, the Bering and Chachki area, the plateau of super, super shallow. Um, this is the Canada Basin. This is the archipelago, Puffin Bay, which is another story all on its own. So I'm going to stay away from that for now. And the Labrador Sea. So what I want you to see, and this on the top is the silicic, these contours represent the silicic acid concentration, just this plain dissolved silica. And here is the isotopic signatures. Uh, this is the isotopic signatures of SiO4. Uh, so one thing I want you to, 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 to see is that the source waters into this, uh, into this Arctic, into the Arctic from the, come from the western side and they channel through the bearing into the Arctic. And you can see that signature right here. So that, that tongue of uh, about, you know, higher, relatively higher uh, um, silicic acid in, rela in relation with everywhere, everything else around here comes in here, and you can see this tank of silicic acid coming in below the surface, and it's sort of, when it gets around the archipelago, it sort of disappears. I'm talking surface, so just look at the surface. So on the surface right here, Try not to look at that. And the surface out there, you see this tongue coming in and sort of dissipating after the archipelago. 
when we look at the silicon stopping signatures, you see these lower concentrations coming together with it. This is Pacific origin waters. Uh, they're coming in here with, with low, uh, low isotopic signatures, and then they, again, they diffuse right here. So we want to know is if we follow these signals from the Pacific to the e to the from the Pacific yeah that's right from the west to the east and we look at the uh, what diagrams are doing what is the how do these things these two things match up? So I'm going to show you profiles of these three regions on this Pacific and the, the water coming into the uh, from the Pacific after it was modified a little bit through the through the Chachki and then in the Canadian Arctic Bay level and then down here and we have as I, as you know now because I show you that see so uptake data by diatoms on this region right here and we're going what the idea is to see are those profiles changing um, in accordance to what we understand of what diatoms are doing to these waters. So if we start on the west, so we start right here on this, the profile of, um, these are, it's very shallow, very, as opposed to other regions that are much, much deeper. Um, we have here the uh, uh, isotopy signatures, and this is the uh, silicon, uh, just the dissolved silicate. Uh, these waters right here under the surface are considered the Pacific origin waters. Right at the surface, you have lots of modifications from, uh, mainly from uh, meltwater and river water. Uh, but um, this is the Pacific origin water. So this is your source that goes to spread through towards the east. So if we look at now what happened when the water got up here in the in the uh, um, Canada Basin, remember this region has very low productivity, so I would expect the signals maybe not change that much because there's not many diatoms doing much there. And it is true. So this now, this block that I have here, the top of the, the, this box coincides with these. These are the Pacific waters, and now they're detected at that depth. So they moved down here um, when they're moving into this region, and the signals are basically the same. So there's not much modification of those waters when they're moving from that to that other region in the, in the Canada Basin. However, if we now, this water is going to keep moving and it's going to move to the east and it's going to go through the Canadian archipelago. When it goes through there, we know that, as I showed you before, there is a lot of diatom production happening in the archipelago. So those signals should then be uh, affected by the production by diatoms or the use of silicic acid by diatoms. So this is what I showed you before. This is what we observe here. So there is uh, uh, a lot of silicic acid in the water. This water now is not that, that deep. It actually moves closer to the surface. So that is, is, is exposed to be used by phytoplankton that are, for diatoms that are closer to the surface. Um, and this silicic acid concentrations that are pretty high right here, we have values of about 30 or so, are being used up. So you see the uptake rates are high and they decrease as this silicic acid decreases. So and then if this is affecting these signals, what is that we could see at the other end when we get to Baffin Bay? Uh, and good to see, and this we saw it two days ago, that the signals are modified in such a way, once you get here, this is our waters now that may be moving like this, and now the signals have been modified where you could see the, uh, the isotopic signature has increased in relation to uh, these source waters, and the silicic acid have decreased considerably here uh, in relation to those waters. So this reflects utilization by diatoms, and if we look, if we actually take this data and you, we apply a fractionation factor that we know diatoms could and the way that atoms could affect that water, we, we get exactly those values. So we know then that those, the change in these signals are uh, an indication of the utilization by, by diatoms, which, is, which we know that it happens, but quantifying it is, is the issue. So what do we know so far? We know that, I show you that this panarctic snapshot of primary production, and this is the first time that we've seen it experimentally measured before people have these snapshots of from satellite images, but from going there and measuring a consistent methodology throughout the region, we believe it's the first time it was done. Um, we observe high variability, as, as you saw, in the, in the Arctic subarctic oceans with oligotrophic conditions in the central Arctic with this hotspot of activity in both ends. Um, at a small scale, with this uh, tracer, you could look at you know, what the individual genera are doing of diatoms and see that lower abundance doesn't necessarily mean they have little impact, but they could actually have important impact because they could be very active. 
And finally, this large scale uh, um, and the large scale or basin scale, these uh, isotopic signals are reflecting, it shows that they not only reflect the, the composition of biomass through the water column, but at the surface, they also reflect the silicon utilization in the modified Pacific, water, Pacific waters as this water travels from west to east. But that got moved. I was supposed to, to have that, that box around the snapshot. Uh, so uh, and the key thing is that all I've shown you so far is our snapshots. Um, not many other ways you could do it in the Arctic except with satellite imagery, but satellite imagery is very limited and also looks at the surface also. So all that chlorophyll maximum that you find in the Arctic commonly is, not, is missed by the imagery. So, we, we rely on these when the ships go into the Arctic and the logistics are considerable as anybody working in those situations would know. So what we're trying to do is move beyond that and says, can we, how can we go from the snapshot into understanding you know, more of long-term variability and maybe predicting what's going to happen? There is a lot of researchers out there, principally one that I could think of, who claims that productivity is increasing considering the Arctic and there's a 40% increase already, which a lot of us don't think is we could tell that yet. Um, the, the Arctic is very variable from region to region and uh, and it's not clear yet you know where, if it's increasing or not and it might be in some regions or not in others and you see that in my last slide. Uh, so we're trying to do uh, a different, so we have three projects now that are sort of um, going into the direction of let's see uh, these, these signals in a longer time scale. So this is a, uh, a paper that uh, Victoria Hill from uh, Old Dominion put together, uh, and I was a co-author with her, and she basically pulled data from a very long time, for basically about 62 years of data from all sources. This is source data from satellites and experimental data, and she just pulled it all together with the caveat that different sources of data will have very you know, uh, um, methodological differences. Um, so I'm going to just, uh, she looked at all this specific region, and uh, so I'm going to just focus on the one region here. This is, this is the Bering Strait, so just to locate you in this map. Uh, this is the North Bering, Chachki, and going into the, the Canadian side of the archipelago here. Uh, so she looked at the Pacific region, and just to look at one of these figures in this paper, just this Chachki shelf that I show you that has this high High productivity, she could see from all these different measurements that uh, starting in the 60s, let's say, uh, productivity actually seems to be increasing with huge error bars. And, uh, however, this one measurement um, okay, that was done in 2009, it plummeted down. Whether that's out, an outlier or it's not, or maybe the measurements were taken in different places, it's not clear. Uh, so, which just tells us that there's a lot of inherent, inherent variability in this system. And you, you could see this from this other project, that this is one of my students, is, uh, she has a paper in review, is looking at productivity over this region in a sort of a 10 year, and at the, in a 10 year scale, and we have eight cruises in those 20, 10 years, so we could compare data. And she looked again at these five different regions. This is the region where um, Victoria produced this, this, this uh, um, this figure. So what we could see here, and I saw, it, I want to show you one picture that depicts the the problems on on trying to predict um, productivity changes in the Arctic. She has this data. She produces this data. This is carbon uptake or photosynthetic rate. Uh, this uh, profile that she has here. This is data average over the 10 years, so the eight cruises over the 10 years. This is a profile from this station closer to shore. This is a profile from the station more in the center of the shelf. A uh, great. Uh, hello. Oh, there it is. Um, I could hear that I don't hear myself. Uh, so this gray area represents sort of the range of values over those 10 years. So you can see the variability is gigantic. Uh, and not only is very large for that one station, but it's very large between two stations that are so close together. And this is, uh, um, has to do with many different things, but one uh, thing that is important here is that this, this central region is affected by the Anadir water. It's a very rich nutrient water that comes around Russia, shoots through the Bering Strait, and affects the central part of the Arctic. So lots of production, lots of nutrients. However, these stations closer to shore are influenced by the Alaskan coastal waters that have lower nutrients. So. 
how would we predict how could we predict long term changes in the whole Arctic when you have such changes, local changes and not not only annual but but local um, sorry spatial. And this is the last thing I'm going to tell you. It's another effort that we're trying to make in, in trying to say, well, going to the Arctic is difficult. Uh, making measurements is complicated. So how, why don't we use observatories, right? Um, the Ocean Networks Canada is a very big enterprise that is located at the University of Victoria, and they have observed these long-term automated observatories in different parts uh, of the, Western, the, the, the West Coast and also in the Arctic now. So there is this one observatory. This is, this is where it looks outside water but it's underwater in, in this uh, bay, it's called Cambridge Bay, it's in the high Arctic, I'll show you a map in a second, and uh, it's measuring a number of things, including oxygen. So she went to, the, uh, to, the, to this region, uh, to this uh, really uh, bursting town, and she uh, made measurements of productivity in two months every day. And the idea was, let's measure productivity rates and other things, she doesn't measure just that, over every day through the growing season. And let's compare that to the observatory data. Can we then rely on that observatory data that goes for years without anybody being there uh, and make any estimates of production? So this is where Cambridge Bay is up there. It's in, a, in an island right off the coast. This is an island called Victoria Island, in fact. Um, so this is uh, this is work in progress. Is still working with these data, trying to write up some things for her thesis. But this is the productivity rate, the carbon uptake rate over two months. Uh, the blue uh, represents total production, and you can see. You know, it has increased a bit here right when the ice break. This is the ice break. And then it sort of uh, stays up and down. And it has a little bit blip right at the end here. Um, one thing that was very surprising was that everything small cells. They were very, so you could see the, the, the orangey spots here, are, uh, dots here, are basically the cells that are less than five micrometers in size. And there is also, there's two times when the diatoms seem to increase, which was right here and right there. So okay, she, she got this data basically experimentally by going into this uh, um, very thin ice sometimes, and sometimes with boats and different ways. Uh, difficult work actually, and difficult to get help for it, and very, very expensive. Um, so then we said, okay, let's compare to the observatory data. And one of these uh, data that she used was oxygen, and I, I'll stress that this is really work in progress still, but she looked at the oxygen data and trying to correct the data for physical mechanisms that could uh, change the oxygen concentration. So what she would have here is something related to the oxygen that is biologically produced. So anyway, it goes up and it stays up here. You know, it, it agrees with production. The issue is how do these two things agree with each other? Uh, so she did a very quick correlation and she saw that these oxygen measurements that she got from the observatory correlate quite well, actually, with the productivity rates uh, that we could measure. As it would be expected, right? But that, you know, the more productivity, the more oxygen produced. However, there are so many methodological uh, by, um, um, errors that we didn't know if this would work. So it works quite well, except for these two outliers here, which are just when the ice breaks. Now we, so we know that during ice break, so it's the relationship you hold really well before under the ice and after the ice breaks, but it doesn't hold um, right at the ice break where the dynamics are probably pretty complicated. So then with this now, so she has her own data. This has to be tested again, of course. So she has her own data. Um, she has a correlation. So now using the, the data from the observatory, the oxygen data, she could model sort of the changes of product, the, what we call an apparent carbon utilization coming from this oxygen data and her correlation. And you could see the changes that could be happening for the, oh, these are all the years in which that observatory was in Cambridge Bay. And then from there, from there, you could uh, look at you know, productivity anomalies, compare, comparing it to a long-term trend, and you could also look at the changes uh, in a particular season. So there is potential then to use, uh, you know, use this productivity data compared to the oxygen, okay, the oxygen data can work uh, just to follow productivity over time with data coming from the observatory, which is, you know, comes through uh, um, online directly to your computer, wherever you are. Um, we still see what happens with future data, and we have to go. We would have to actually go out again and now compare this data to, um, um, you know, is, is the new data that we collect next year, for example, fit fit this model? 
So my last slide is then climate and ocean physics changes uh, in the Arctic will impact marine uh, Arctic ecosystems. The issues how are they going to impact them? So and the big question lots of us have is will primary production increase or decrease with temporary and spatially reduced ice cover? And I'm going to disappoint you and I'm going to tell you that it really depends. It's a typical answer from a scientist, but uh, this is very much the case in the Arctic. The Arctic has regions that are deep, uh, farther away from shore. There are large areas with shallow shelves. There are areas with narrow passages and bays and, and lots of tidal mixing. And it's so variable that the changes that we could see with less ice cover will really depend on the region and the impact that that region will have on the nutrient stock. Because if you have more light, then you still need more nutrients for more production. So if the nutrients are there, you may increase production if they are and you want. So this is borrowed again from another paper from Carmack. Eddie Carmack is a very well-known Arctic oceanographer who was the lead, the lead uh, uh, PI in the, in the C3 pro, C3O program. And he put together this cartoon and says, well, it depends where uh, you are looking in the, in the region and what changes will occur. For example, if you are on the Panarctic shelves, there are very extensive shelves in the Arctic, well, productivity may actually go up. You have river input, you have uh, been some nutrients, but there's also a lot more, more exposed surface. Supposedly you have more wind driven upwelling, shelf break upwelling from the wind. So okay, there's a possibility of nutrients coming from underneath, from deeper waters that will fuel the production that is already exposed to more light because there is less ice. However, if you look at now uh, a large scale basin, this is also large scale, lots of uh, shelves. Now we're looking at basins away from the shelves uh, and, and deep. Uh, the, the expectation is productivity may decrease even more if it's possible, it's already very low. Uh, so uh, and the, 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 the way they explain this is that while there's going to the ice melt will produce in this stratification that will uh, interfere with moving of boiling of nutrients from deeper water. So these are all speculations and very simply done, right? So in terms of not considering other factors. But this is a general idea that this, it could go up, well, in the major basins, it could even go down even more. But if we look at these shallow, small areas of the archipelago, there is so much variability there in terms of physics and, 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 and the geology of the area and, and the bottom topography. And so you have these shallow areas with lots of tidal flow and mixing, and nutrients could come to the surface. And then, then okay, it might increase there. And in regions like in the archipelago too, but deeper, uh, we have a similar scenario to the basin with stratification driven by mel ice melt and also the river inflow and many, not many nutrients coming from the surface, although they could come from the rivers, right? But the rivers would also bring turbidity, which could decrease productivity. So it's, it's a really complicated issue. So yes, my, I finish this talk by telling you it will depend. And thank you very much.